This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I've been podcasting for the last three years. I wanted to reach the people who might already be quite comfortable with psychological and emotional issues, those who may have initially and recently been diagnosed with something that they want more information about or just struggling in their relationships. But the third group is those of you who might never consider darkening the door of a therapist, but are just interested enough to tune in to a podcast. January can be a harsh month for many who struggle with depression. Here in the U.S., at least, it's cold and dark, not much sunshine during the day. But there are people all over the world every month, every day, who are facing even harsher tragedy, the traumatic death of someone they love. There are five families whose loved ones died in a helicopter crash recently. One of the dead was Kobe Bryant, a celebrated U.S. basketball star, and his oldest daughter, Gianna. The other victims were children, moms and dads and the pilot, all whose families' lives have been ripped open with both grief but also trauma. I'm going to talk today about mourning, what these people are facing, the difference between grief and trauma, and as always, what you can do about it, or at least what is under your control to do. There's obviously much that is not. The listener email today, a regular feature of self-work, is from someone who asked how she could ever rid herself of a shame she's carried, what she said, from birth. I didn't understand, so I reached out to her for more explanation, and her answer was fascinating to me, because after her explanation, it was clear to see that the shame didn't belong to her at all, and she knew that rationally, but she still feels shame deeply. I'll explain the circumstances in a few minutes but they certainly helped me to understand her confusion and perhaps also led me to an answer that at least I could try to help her with. Please realize that this episode may trigger you if you indeed have had some sort of trauma or sudden death in your history of someone you loved. Please take very good care in listening. Death and family mourning were part of my everyday awareness as I grew up the daughter of a much-beloved funeral director in a small southern town. Wakes, cemetery plots, grave markers, funeral arrangements, caskets, all of it was part of my daily world. Dinner conversation would touch on who my dad had helped that day, but his words weren't normally tinged with sadness as dad kept a lot of that from us. We grew up in the seen-but-not-heard child-rearing belief system— So most often, my brothers and I would do the silent kicking under the table thing while Mother was catching up with Dad on the events of their days. Yet I recognize now that the inevitability of loss was evident to me from quite a young age. It was a fact that I could not ignore. But it wouldn't have an emotional connection unless, of course, someone who died we had loved. Then we grieved as every family did. In January, we were shocked by the helicopter accident in California that killed nine people, Kobe Bryant and his young daughter Gianna being among those who didn't survive the crash. And there's been obviously a lot of news about the two of them. The quote-unquote other seven on board, as some articles put it, weren't exactly discounted, but I was tremendously moved as others began to write about the other seven, as well as their loved ones whose lives had been shattered. And I have included a link to one of those articles that I found to be most moving. None of these family members will ever see fog rolling in or hear a helicopter's whir without remembering, without mourning. Their grief will consume them as they're triggered suddenly or not so suddenly by reminders, memories, songs, silly things, achingly poignant things, day-to-day life things, With this kind of sudden death and grief, there are painfully no goodbyes except the ones we all say when a quick trip will bring with it the normal 
have a good time or don't forget to text me if you're going to be late. Maybe an I love you as I headed out the door. But that was it. There was no urge to say anything but what was typical. And yet, nothing was typical on that day or that night or the weeks and months that will come. These families will have to face that one minute their world was safe and the next it wasn't. That shock takes a long time to heal. CNN writer Pat Etheridge reminds us that these family members aren't only dealing with grief, but trauma. That's because it involved safety and security. And there is no safety and security anymore. Their lives have been tragically touched by trauma. This is what perhaps our culture doesn't understand. That sudden loss is a different thing than expected loss. Both are grief, but because sudden death is also traumatic, it can impede grief work for quite a long time. Why? Because it's not just denial that's being felt. It's disbelief. And if there are no human remains, no ability to see for yourself what happened or the reality of the death itself, then that very absence can complicate things. Someone you love simply disappears. What do I mean by trauma? It's not only shock. According to the American Psychological Association, trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Now we've all heard the term, the shock has worn off. What does that mean? What that means is that the initial mental and emotional freeze that sense that maybe time has stopped or you're in some kind of unreality, begins to decrease and the reality of the death and its implications come more into focus. Longer-term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms like headache or nausea. That, again, was the APA's list. I'd add to that sleeping problems, eating problems, isolation and nightmares, and suicidal thoughts. Actually, I don't think there's much that can't be experienced with this kind of trauma. And if these loved ones had had trauma in their history, that can also affect just how complex this process is. From people I have seen that have gone through this kind of trauma, I've learned one of the hardest things to face over time is one fact, that others' lives go on, your life goes on, and time will not stop. But you don't know how you're going to live through that time. One parent told me after one of her children died suddenly in a bizarre accident, you don't just go through hell and back again. You go through hell and back many times over. But all of this grieving, this going to hell and back, is done in the midst of time marching on. You'll see a Facebook or an Instagram post that someone's mom is turning 90 or a grandparent is traveling to meet their new grandchild. You'll go to the park and see mothers and daughters walking arm in arm or even having a fight. Or you pass by a restaurant where an entire family has gathered for a reunion. Meetings are held. College entrance exams are taken. New glasses are needed. Wars broke out. Awards are won or games are lost. Trips to the grocery store have to happen. Other deaths, some anticipated, some not, occur. Fires and other tragedies take their place in the news. Birthdays, no longer times to look forward to, are gotten through. Holidays become heavily tinged with loss. And life keeps happening. Sadness, fear, anger, denial, depression, anxiety, all aspects of grief are excruciatingly experienced. And healing can be slow. There is no good answer to the question why. There is no way to stop time. It keeps coming at these loved ones, these families, as they face indescribable loss, each moment seeming harder than the one that came before it, at least for a while. So where do you fit in? How can you help? Our culture in the United States doesn't tolerate this time well. We want people to heal and heal quickly. And it's true that over a great deal of time, the ones grieving will build some sense of normalcy, however painful. But this new normal was created through tragedy and trauma, 
And that makes it a far different grief than others you might experience or perhaps you've experienced yourself. You can see it after any kind of death that happens suddenly without warning. You'll see shock and you'll see trauma reactions. One of the last things you should start talking about if you want to try to help someone going through this kind of trauma is to talk about your own experience with other kinds of grief. That's a big no-no. Your grief is very important. It was horrible for you, maybe even tragic. But the process of going through both death and trauma aren't comparable. So please, if you love someone with this kind of grief or what I'd term deep mourning, don't simply reach out now. Put a note in your calendar one month from now, six months from now, a year from now or two, and reach out again. Realize that often the second or even third year of living out this new normal can be the most difficult. As with each day, the reality begins to seep in even more deeply that the one grieving will be living at least for a long while, with an aching loneliness. Mourning takes time and a lot of it. Be patient. Be aware if people grieving are struggling and losing their battle. That's when you may need to step in. Don't offer platitudes, especially not religious ones. Remember, you don't have to explain this trauma, this death away. You can't fix it. What you can do is ask the ones grieving what you can do and then do it. Offer to do something and then do it. How many times have my patients said, someone will text and say, a couple of weeks after the trauma has occurred, please let me know if you need anything, and nothing is ever done. So sometimes you have to press people to say, let me pick up your kids at school, or why don't you give me a grocery list, and I'll go pick it up for you. Whatever you can do, that action is so much more appreciated than the words behind that desire. But if you're actually physically in the presence of someone who's struggling with this mixture of grief and trauma, all you really have to do is simply sit in that space with them. Here's a therapeutic example of this. Through the years, I've had more than one, in fact, several people ask me if certain traumas have happened to me. Was I sexually abused? Have I had a child die? These questions, in fact, are probably the two most common. And the answer to both those questions is no. And they may very well decide to not work with me because of that. But what I have done, I have sat in the space with people whose grief is incredibly palpable in the room. It's like a living, breathing entity between us. As time marches on, It can become harder and harder for these victims of such trauma to ask for help, especially if they're struggling. They're saying to themselves, I should be doing better. I have to go on for my children. They almost shame themselves for how long this process is taking. So what you can do is give them permission. Tell them you understand that it takes a long time. So in therapy, often I just sit with my patients who experience something like this. I let them talk. I ask questions to help them discover more of what's happened and where they are now. Maybe even where they want to head. But simply sitting with them is the best. Their lives have already gotten out of control. The last thing they need is to further lose control of what's happening around them. If they want to be alone, fine. But sometimes simply being with someone who's in this shattered a place in their lives is really all they need. They just need your presence. Years ago, I took an American Red Cross training to become a first responder to victims of tragedy if the moment so arose. And actually, the Red Cross made the same point. They said, if we send you out to a city where a tornado has ripped through a school or a town, just walk around, help out, ask what you can do, and let people talk. Whatever they want to talk about, be available be present. I've talked before on self-work about how so many of us steer clear of grief. We become afraid ourselves. We become triggered ourselves. What if that happened to me? So you really need to put that aside and remember to be present with someone else. You don't have an agenda. You're just there.
you can look around for what that person may need. For example, I had a patient tell me that after a death, a very sudden death, a lot of people, instead of bringing food, brought her coupons to different places. And that was so much more helpful than having scads of food around. She could give one of them to her children and say, why don't y'all drive over to here and use this? It was very, very helpful. Look for practical things, pragmatic things. That's where more action-oriented people can really help. But if you're the kind of person that can just sit with grief without becoming afraid yourself, then look for that opportunity as well. With each passing second, each breath inhaled and exhaled, the mourners' lives are moving on. So what you can do is be a support and be there. Today we have a listener email who used the SpeakPipe feature that you can find on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com or in the show notes wherever you listen, and you can actually leave me a voicemail message. I love it when people do it. So here's one from a listener. Dr. Margaret, I enjoyed listening to your podcast interview with Lewis Howells. I was just wondering, it's okay to be comfortable, like you said, to be comfortable with vulnerability. But what about when you're carrying shame and it's not yours, it's someone else's from from childbirth? If you could let me know how you would best... Yeah, I'd love your response on that. Thank you so much. Blessings. This was an interesting question, but I didn't really understand it completely. I understood it. It's not that the words didn't mean anything to me, but I wondered what the situation had been. And so she wrote me back and told me, The shame that I have inside of me from birth stems from an affair that my father had with my mother's underage sister while my mom was pregnant with me. They continued the affair, unknown to my mother for years, and my aunt suffered terribly as a result after it ended. She never really recovered, suffering drug use and mental problems for decades. And her children suffered because their mother wasn't there. So as I grew up, I found myself, despite my youth, being a surrogate mother to them. There were also legal issues that surrounded my family. My mother's sister had dealings with the drug trade here in Australia. But even from a young age, I knew my mother resented me. She's told me as much my entire life. My mother is a brilliant professional woman, but lacks a maternal side. When my parents finally separated, it was not amicable, and I found myself the messenger between them, relaying harsh words from one to the other. Rationally, I know that none of what happened is my fault, but I still feel shame, and even writing this is painful. This shame has also resulted in my having unfortunate romantic partnerships. I realize this is all happening on an unconscious level, and I used to not realize until well into the relationship that the men were wholly unsuitable for me and or romantically unavailable. I've never known what a loving romantic partnership was. I don't think my parents loved each other for as long as I've been alive or even before, and so I find it hard to recognize what a healthy relationship is. This is one of the reasons why I'm a childless 40-year-old single lady. There has been a benefit to being forced to grow up so quickly and look after my younger relatives. It's filled me with a lifelong wish to nurture. So I've become a universal mother. I've realized this by being a host mom for international students for almost 15 years. This explanation certainly turned on some light bulbs for me and probably for you. I let her know that I'd be answering her in this episode, so I hope that she's listening. So here's my response. It certainly sounds to me as if a huge part of the reason you're struggling to let go of this shame is that you had no one in your world for comfort. So you were left with almost what I term an existential kind of shame. I've never actually seen that term before, although it might be out there, certainly. What I mean by that is that you were resented and blamed by your mom. So your very existence was branded at the very beginning as wrong, unwanted. Your mom may have been brilliant, but she seems to have been looking everywhere but within herself for the reason she was unhappy. 
I can see, trying to cut her some slack, that without knowing about the affair, she could have believed that her pregnancy and birth caused some kind of problem between her and your dad, since it all occurred at the same time. Maybe her gut was telling her something was very wrong, but she totally projected her unhappiness onto your existence. There was no way to escape that. You couldn't be funny enough. You couldn't be smart enough. You couldn't be responsible enough. What you could do was to try to do what your mother and father wanted you to do. Somehow, perhaps earning a look of appreciation or understanding. And boy, did you take on responsibility for the chaos that adults were bringing into the world by becoming a pseudo-mom to your aunt's children probably not even completely understanding why you felt as protective as you did. It may very well be that you didn't want those children to feel what you felt all the time. So what now? Listeners to this podcast have heard me say before that insight is a wonderful thing. It adds context. It can help us see patterns. But it doesn't lead to hope. And this listener needs hope. So here we go again. I think you're quite insightful to realize that you're seeking relationships where you will not be valued. We often, unfortunately, seek the familiar. So the question I like to ask people is this. If you weren't so ashamed, what else might you feel? This question can also apply to fear or anger or any emotion that seems to be your go-to. Maybe you're putting on shame every day because it's familiar, like an old coat that you're tired of, but for some reason you still put it on every day. So once underneath that shame, one of my guesses would be that there's anger. You don't want to be like your parents, angry all the time, but in your attempt to do that, you may not be connecting with your own. My advice would be to journal and talk about that and see if you can connect. You don't have to confront anyone. It doesn't sound as if anyone in your world is mature enough to handle that well anyway. Please don't get confused between connecting with your anger and acting out of anger. They are very different. But when I see someone who tells me they are stuck in some kind of emotion, some kind of shame or fear or whatever, then I begin to wonder what's underneath that's simply, in many ways, harder to deal with. There are some wonderful books on anger and bad parenting. In fact, there are a whole lot of them. One of the ones I'm familiar with is The Dance of Anger by Harriet Lerner. It does talk more about anger in relationships, however. So there's another good one called Toxic Parents. I'll have both of those links in the show notes. Maybe you can help yourself get out of your irrational head by allowing yourself to feel sadness or anger or whatever else is there. I know you know this rationally, but that shame is not yours to carry. I want to thank all of you for many things for being here, but one is something happened to me this week. I was searching for some information and I went back to one of my very, very early podcasts. In fact, I think it was episode five or six. And I just want to thank you all for hanging in there with me because it's definitely been a learning curve. I hear what I sounded like back then and I think, wow, I was so nervous and that came across. Maybe you can't hear it, but I certainly can. So I appreciate and am very grateful for your presence here and your patience with me. There are lots of ways to reach out to me. You can email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. You can go to my website at DrMargaretRutherford.com, and you can subscribe there, and you'll get a weekly newsletter with both this podcast in it as well as my weekly blog post. It's a very easy way of making sure that you see what comes out on self-work. My book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, has now been out for three months, and if you've read it, I would so appreciate a review on Amazon that may seem daunting to some of you, like it has to be perfect, especially if you're reading the book, (laughs) but it really doesn't have to be. One of the best ones that I've seen so far was just literally two sentences and talked about the effect of the book on her. Some of you have written and said, we want to show you our gratitude. I don't have a Patreon account, at least not now. I'm really adverse to doing it where people can actually pay 
in appreciation for this podcast, but I don't know, somehow that rubs me wrong. But this is something you can do, either leaving a review on iTunes for the podcast or wherever you listen, or if you're reading Perfectly Hidden Depression or you've finished it, to please leave a review there on Amazon especially, or Goodreads. I'm over on Instagram as well and Facebook, both of those at Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Please come out and check those out. I often, on that Facebook page at least, also send in articles that I find challenging or stimulating not just all my stuff, but a good deal of my stuff as well. And one more way you can get in touch with me is through my Facebook closed group. That's facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Don't forget to answer the questions because I need to know, I need to hear your voice and what maybe you are searching for. It's a very diverse, wonderful group, both women and men. So feel free to join facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Thank you so much for being here again. My gratitude to you. Take very good care. This is Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.